The prince was summoned to attend the queen in her drawing room. He came where I was alone, and I said that I thought he must be aware why I wished him to come here, and that it would make me very happy if he would consent to my wishes. He said he would. I felt it was the happiest, brightest moment of my life. Four months later, the country celebrated a royal wedding. But the official fanfare masked a distinct lack of popular enthusiasm for the marriage. As she dressed for the ceremony, Victoria was aware that many of her subjects viewed her choice of husband with dismay. Albert was foreign, and he was poor. Parliament reflected the public mood. They refused to grant Albert the title of king. In fact, they refused to grant him any title at all. During the marriage service, Victoria promised to honor and obey a husband who was now bound as a loyal subject to honor and obey her, the wife of the American ambassador, who was one of the guests, commented on the irony of an impoverished German prince endowing the queen with all his worldly goods. <laughs> prince Albert had won the hand of a queen that he would have a hard fight to win the hearts of her people. For the moment, the royal couple had to make do with their love for each other. Victoria wrote in her diary of her relief when they finally escaped the guests at the reception. Then dearest Albert fetched me downstairs, where we took leave of Mama and drove off. I and Albert, alone. Victoria had chosen to spend the honeymoon just a few miles from London at the ancient castle of Windsor, home to the kings and queens of England since the 12th century. The wedding night uh, apparently went off very well. And the next morning she told the prime minister uh, that uh, they had a wonderful night and she didn't sleep much that night. And she added in her diary uh, that dear Albert helped me put on my stockings in the morning. To Albert's dismay, Victoria refused to take more than four days break from the business of government. She was, she gently chided him, the Queen of England. This begged the question, what then was Albert? He knew that he would have to find something to do merely uh, to make life uh, bearable for himself. What was he to do other than ensure the succession? The other job uh, he had to find, that is some kind of manly, uh, useful work in the, uh, in the administration. That was hard to do because Victoria didn't want to give up anything. Uh, she wanted to reign. Uh, she wanted to rule. Uh, she wanted to be alone with her advisors and uh, put Albert to the side. All he had to do at the start uh, was to blot her signature. They had desks side by side in the palace, and uh, his job was to move over to hers and blot the signatures. When they were driving together in their carriage, it was Victoria who invariably took the reins. That provoked jokes about her holding the whip hand. It was a side of the Queen's character that caused problems for other men in her life, notably the leading members of Her Majesty's government. The Queen may have wanted to rule alone, but in reality she had to rule with the consent of Parliament. Former kings and queens of England had accepted rules binding them to choose the government from among those men who commanded a majority in the elected House of Commons. Victoria found this hard. She was a headstrong young woman who constantly kicked against the limits of her power. Her ministers soon realized 
that Albert had more patience for dealing with complex affairs of state, and they encouraged Victoria to include him in their regular briefings. Soon he was doing more than blot the Queen's signature, as the Queen became distracted by an event that took her mind off government business. When Victoria became pregnant, she began to feel discomfort, uh, uh, the usual things that one associates with pregnancy. And so she gave more and more jobs to Albert to do. Albert began to draft her letters. Albert began uh, to meet with her ministers. Uh, Albert became, in effect, uh, the associate uh, sovereign. The chief secretary to the government noted that while Victoria had the title, Albert was really discharging the duties and functions of the sovereign. He was, to all intents and purposes, king. Albert was an intellectual. Uh, he grasped things very quickly. He learned English very quickly. Uh, he read a great deal. He knew everything that was going on. He read all the mail that came through in the cabinet red boxes. Uh, Albert was, in effect, uh, taking charge. Albert had a lively interest in industry and invention, and he wanted the Queen to share it. He introduced her to developments in technology that, without his enthusiasm, might have seemed too complex, too mechanical, too grubby for her royal attention. He tried to open her eyes to the ideas and opinions that were uprooting the old Britain, ideas and opinions that were about to shake the world. Albert thought that the world was going to change whether or not they liked it, and he wanted it to change in a way that was going to be useful for people. He wanted their standard of living improved. Uh, he wanted wealth to be uh, better uh, distributed. Uh, he wanted more people to have the advantages of the new inventions. Uh, in that sense, he was quite a social liberal. In 1842, the prince took a trip on one of the new railroads, the Great Western that linked London with the port of Bristol on the west coast of England. The 120-mile journey would have taken 15 hours by stagecoach. The railroad did it in three. Waiting for him at the end of the line was the man who had built it, a man whose name had a ring of grandeur to match the age he lived in, Esimbard Kingdom Brunel. He was the most famous engineer in the world, and he devoted his life to making it a smaller place. Victoria had inherited an empire that spanned the globe, but her scattered possessions were separated by thousands of miles of ocean. In the days of sail, it could take three months to cross the Atlantic, six to reach India, even longer to make the passage to the Queen's dominions of Australia and New Zealand. Brunel mastered the technology to weld these disparate elements into an empire. He had conceived of the SS Great Britain as the first all-iron steamship, doubling the size of any ship ever built before. She was designed to cut the journey time across the Atlantic from around three months to a reliable 15 days. Brunel personified the spirit of limitless ambition that was to be the hallmark of Victoria's empire. He seized the opportunity of Prince Albert's visit to convince him of the potential of this dynamic new method of transport. Steamships had been ridiculed by their critics, who argued that they would need so much coal for their engines there would be no space left for cargo. Brunel demolished this myth with a complex mathematical equation. In simple terms, he proved that the bigger the ship, the bigger the proportion that could be used for cargo or passengers or troops. It was the beginning of the end for the great days of sail. The SS Great Britain would be the first of this new breed of ocean steamers that would bind the mother country ever more closely to her imperial possessions. And their ability to steam in a straight line regardless of winds or currents 
would have a vital impact on one of the other great inventions of the Victorian age. In 1837, inventors on both sides of the Atlantic had simultaneously created the electric telegraph. Brunel argued that his railroads provided a perfect route for the telegraph wires that would link city to city, while his steamships could lay telegraph cables across the seas to link nation to nation. Brunel inspired the young prince with the vision of the first modern empire, an empire based not on conquest, but on commerce and communication. In 1845, Britain was a global superpower. It had a monopoly of the latest technology based upon steam. It also possessed the greatest capacity for manufacturing and a vast surplus of capital. Now, if these assets are to be used to their best effect, British businessmen had to sell cheaply, and buy cheaply. And in the 1840s, it was clear that Britain could no longer produce enough food for its people. So it needed inexpensive food. The vision of a modern technological empire was threatened by the lack of the most basic commodity in the world, grain. Despite the new inventions, British agriculture could not provide enough bread to feed the millions who had flocked to the cities in search of work. They threatened riot and rebellion. America could supply vast quantities of grain, but this was opposed by the most powerful lobby in Victoria's empire. The landlords, the squires, were the dominant power in Parliament. Their wealth came from agriculture, and they were determined to maintain a high price for their crops, especially grain. They used their votes in Parliament to impose high import duties on foreign grain, the infamous Corn Laws, and they would bring the country to the brink of armed insurrection. Prince Albert warned the Queen of the serious danger of civil war with the manufacturers, the hungry and the poor, lined up against the aristocracy. Warned that this could only end in the ruin of the aristocracy and the end of the monarchy. That it could even threaten Victoria's life. The crisis came to a head in Britain's oldest colony, Ireland. In the reign of Victoria, the whole of Ireland belonged to Britain. Most of the country was owned by English landlords who rarely visited their estates in Ireland. The tenants were poor Irish farmers. Most grew nothing but potatoes, which was all they had to eat. An English traveler noted the grave inequality in wealth. Landlords first get all that is made of the land and the tenants, for their labor, get poverty and potatoes. In 1845, the Irish potato crop was hit by a mysterious blight that turned the tubers black and rotten. The harvest was ruined. Eyewitnesses chronicled the growing anguish and despair. Distress and fear were pictured on every face. The wretched people wringing their hands and wailing bitterly against the destruction that had left them foodless. For a while they lived on nettles and other weeds. Then they began to starve. English magistrates filed grim reports. I entered some of the hovels. In the first, six famished skeletons, to all appearances dead, were huddled in a corner. I approached with horror, found by their low moaning that they were still alive. 
The prince was summoned to attend the queen in her drawing room. He came where I was alone, and I said that I thought he must be aware why I wished him to come here, and that it would make me very happy if he would consent to my wishes. He said he would. I felt it was the happiest, brightest moment of my life. Four months later, Lichent Castle of Windsor, home to the kings and queens of England since the 12th century. The wedding night uh, apparently went off very well. And the next morning, she told the prime minister uh, that uh, they had a wonderful night and she didn't sleep much that night. And she added in her diary, uh, that dear Albert helped me put on my stockings in the morning. To Albert's dismay, Victoria refused to take more than four days. The country celebrated a royal wedding. But the official fanfare masked a distinct lack of popular enthusiasm for the marriage. As she dressed for the ceremony, Victoria was aware that many of her subjects viewed her choice of husband with dismay. Albert was foreign, and he was poor. Parliament reflected the public mood. They refused to grant Albert the title of king. In fact, they refused to grant him any title at all. During the marriage service, Victoria promised to the moment the royal couple had to make do with their love for each other. Victoria wrote in her diary of her relief when they finally escaped the guests at the reception. Then dearest Albert fetched me downstairs, where we took leave of Mama and drove off. I and Albert, alone. Victoria had chosen to spend the honeymoon just a few miles from London, at the end to honor and obey a husband who was now bound as a loyal subject to honor and obey her, the wife of the American ambassador, who was one of the guests, commented on the irony of an impoverished German prince endowing the queen with all his worldly goods. <laughs> prince Albert had won the hand of a queen that he would have a hard fight to win the hearts of her people. 